Welcome to SII ThinkPod. My name is Francisco. And I'm Aziz. And at ThinkPod, we speak about the smartest ideas and the biggest challenges facing the world right now. We speak about where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. Today's guest on ThinkPod is Tayo Aviasu, the founder and group CEO of Paga, a mobile payments company that is revolutionizing digital banking in Africa. We discuss the sustainability of cryptocurrencies and ask, are we moving towards a purely cashless society? Welcome, Tayo. How are you? Thank you very much, guys. Really glad to be here. So our first question is, you operate in the domain of digital payments, right? Talk to us about the, the area that you're working in. Talk mm. to us about Paga as well and what got you starting Paga. What Paga is doing is we are building the PayPal or Square Inc. for Africa. And the problem that we're trying to solve is the fact that Africa is way behind when it comes to financial infrastructure and it's broken. Um, if I take Nigeria as an example, 61% of Nigerians are unbanked. All of us are underbanked in Nigeria. And we fundamentally believe that to solve this problem that you have to have what we call a mix of offline and online payment solutions to build an ecosystem because digital only in these markets don't quite work today. So fundamentally what we are trying to do is we want to make it simple for people to pay and get paid, shop and sell, and access financial services. That is what Paga is doing, similar to how a PayPal has achieved that in the U.S. in building this ecosystem for a variety of both consumers and for sellers. What are some of the risks of a cashless society? I don't think there are a lot of risks to a cashless society, right? Um, and my central bank friends will argue with me <laughs> <laughs> on this. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately there are certain risks that a central bank or a government will want to make sure customers are protected, mm. they'll want to make sure that they can fight um, money laundering. And I think you can achieve all those things even in the cashless world. The benefits way outweigh any, any sort of risks that you see because on Paga, I can use Paga on this mobile phone, which is a smartphone, I can use it on a feature phone as well. If I lose my phone, my money's fine. My money's not on the phone, exactly. mm. right? So it's in the cloud, it's being counted in the cloud and, and very soon on a, on a blockchain ledger that anybody can figure out, right? So I think the actual risks of cashless are very low. And the things that governments care about in terms of making sure they have control of monetary policy and all those things, they can solve with their digital currencies. And I think that's what we're going to see starting to happen. But what's unfortunate is I think we, as we saw in China recently, um, the ban on crypto, other cryptocurrencies, I think that's unfortunate because I think you need those to also exist outside of the central bank controlled digital currency. So you talked about accessibility being an issue, mm -hmm. right? How are you going to make it accessible? How do you think it can be made accessible? The great question, because this was my big aha that led me to start Paga, was, you know, I was thinking, here I am in Nigeria, I was banked with two banks, and yet I had to carry cash with me everywhere. But the problem is worse for everybody else who's not banked. And I'd used PayPal. So I was like, how do you get people who are not accessible to digital world? Because smartphone penetration is like 12%. So it's super low. Mm. Actually, it's 12% now. So then it was like almost nothing, right? That was in 2009. And the big aha was that you get people to use the neighborhood supermarket, the neighborhood store. That guy who I go buy bread from every Saturday has always been there <laughs> since I've been living here. He knows me. He sells me bread on credit. I trust that guy. So why don't we get that guy to use a digital platform? And then the people that come to them give them cash to perform their transactions. And that's how the concept of what we call agents started. And so what we've done in Nigeria with Paga is that we have built a network of retail points. These are mom and pop shops across Nigeria who have over 60,000 points of presence right now where people can walk into, give them cash, and actually perform a transaction. So that starts getting you accessibility into the mass market, right? So today we now have about 18.6 million users on our platform. Wow. 15.1 million of those people go to those agents on a regular basis. Wow. Right. So that's how you now start getting them comfortable with the idea of digital payments. It's a bridge and then eventually getting them to open their own accounts on any type of phone they have, which is the second step of accessibility. Because like I said, smartphone penetration is super low. So you have to, we have built a service that works on feature phones. So on any phone, any feature phone, I can dial star 242 hash in Nigeria on any mobile network and I'll access Paga. And it's a menu driven system. I can save my cash on there. 
and I can send money to people, I can pay my bills, I can do all my transactions, access savings, etc. right from my phone. Yeah. So that agent network yeah. is quite unique. Are there any other unique features that you could highlight? Yeah, so the, so the agent network is, is unique, the USSD accessibility on feature phones. And then I think the other thing about us that is also fairly different than maybe the Western world in terms of how we operate our services, and, I, and to me it was a real surprise actually. I, and the first time I, it hit me that it was a surprise is that I was having dinner, a few of us were having dinner with Jack Dorsey when he came to visit Nigeria. And when I demoed Paga to him, he was like, you could pay your bills on there? I was like, oh, wait a second, that's true. I can't pay my bills on Cash App. <laughs> like, that's true. So I think that's a bit different in our market. And then I think what we are doing is on one side is that consumer side, right, of just giving people accessibility, allowing you to link all your bank accounts. So open banking, so we're going into that mode where we don't care where your money sits as Paga. Like, your money could be anywhere, and we allow you to link all your accounts into one place and do your transactions from there. Do you believe the technology you're building, I mean, it's built to the specific conditions of, of Nigeria, but do you think it's scalable, A, to the region, yeah. and B, to other parts of the world? Yeah, very much. And from day one, this was part of our thinking, right? Um, so we built a platform that is multi-currency, multilingual, and cloud-based, right? And our ambition is we want to make it simple for a billion people to access and use money. And so part of our thinking, even when we're thinking of where we go outside now, outside of Nigeria, is looking for similar kinds of markets. So, I mean, I got on a plane and I went to Indonesia, I went to the Philippines, I went to Mexico, I went to Ethiopia. And initially, we actually thought we would go to Mexico, right, um, as a point. But we've now actually pulled back from doing that, so we're no more going to Mexico. Um, we're going to focus on Africa, right? So we just got our license in Ethiopia. And we're also now looking at other markets in Africa where we can play. So the, the way we've built the platform works across multiple countries. Um, and it's very easy for us to actually move most of the rails, right? And we just uh, were partnered with Visa. So we just integrated to Visa for card payments directly. So that also moves with us wherever we go, right? So now in each country, it will be about plugging into the banking systems. So something you mentioned mid-conversation was crypto and how you mm. have a very differing opinion on crypto than <laughs> central banks do, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is your opinion? I mean, when I started Paga, my vision was a cashless society, right? Where physical notes didn't exist. And you have to remember, this was in 2009. No one was talking about crypto or any of these things, right? Bitcoin barely had just started. I believe that Bitcoin has the power to be the currency of the internet. It's something I, I really believe. And if you think about all the different cryptocurrencies, what I like especially about it is it's true decentralized nature, right? No one's controlling anything. Um, and we can confirm everything, right, that's going on. And I think that gives it a ubiquity that is, that is great, right? I can tell our transaction actually went through, you can confirm it even, right? We can, we, we, there's just clarity and transparency in everything going on. My view is that governments, though, will not use Bitcoin as their currency. We have one country doing it already, fine. But I think in general, that's not gonna be the case. I think in general, countries will have their own central bank digital currency, because rightly as a country, I wanna control my macroeconomic policies, right? I get that, and I think that's also fine. So um, I'm actually on the advisory board for a digital dollar, right? Um, and so I get it, Nigeria is also having its own digital currency, that's great. But I think they should also allow any other cryptocurrency. Now I, I specifically think Bitcoin is the one, but sure, Ethereum, and I hold Ethereum as well, We'll, we'll, we'll be there, right? Um, you know, and if you want to create your own coin and then people come in, <laughs> great, <laughs> like, that's awesome, right? Um, so I think we should allow all of those things, but think of it the way the United States has done it a little bit, where you do still KYC people, you do still have some reporting rules, right? If you transact above X amount of Bitcoin, it has to be reported to the regulator. The same way, if you transact over $10,000 on Paga, we have to report it to the regulator, right? Like, you know, it's just, those are standard things for anti-money laundering, et cetera. So I think those rules can still be in place and still allow for the public to use Bitcoin, to use these transactions. Now, the concern about, I mean, if we're all being honest with ourselves, right, the concern about the shady uh, side of the world, um, they also have to go digital, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. whether you like it or not. So, you know, they've got to also have their own currency, right? Like, <laughs> and that's just a reality. Like, so you can either pretend it's not there or just accept that it's there and it's going to be there. It's been there before all of us and it'll be there forever. So, so in summary, my view is that, look, the problem we're all solving in payments is what I call a key exchange problem. I have something of value, you have something of value, how do we exchange? And that problem has existed all of time, right? It started with metal coins in China, right? Like in, and then, you know, precious metal, you know, and, and just sort of evolved, the solution evolved. 
Today it's crypto. Who knows what it's going to be in 100 years? Do you think, obviously we're in a bull market with crypto. Mm. Do you see that lasting for much longer or do you see a correction coming? That you always go in cycles. So yeah. you, always have this, you always have the cycles of that. So today, a lot of people are using, in most of the world, are using crypto from an asset perspective, yes, yeah. right? And thus, the, all the speculation. In Nigeria, Nigeria is the second largest Bitcoin value processed in the world. And the reason is very simple. Um, it's people are using it to move money out of the country for remittances. So cryptocurrencies have that potential for remittances, but I also think it can be day-to-day -day use. And as that day-to-day -day use increases, the less the speculation type stuff. So, so I was trying to come back to the, to the spec, because I think the speculation is what's leading to yeah, all the ups the and downs and the yeah. bubbles, right? Um, but I think over time that would sort of mellow a little bit more. Do you feel that coins like Bitcoin are sustainable in the long term? The energy produced to generate them is, is enormous. We're going to the moon, man. <laughs> <laughs> the Bitcoin farm is going to the moon. I mean, that, 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 is, that is where we're going. I'm, I'm serious. This is, this is where we're going, right? Like, why are we going to go? Why are we not going to the moon, right? Like, we are going to create the Bitcoin farms outside of Earth, right? Um, we're going to do it. Like, it's going to happen. This coins like Solana and so forth that are definitely sure, more sustainable. They're more sustainable. Yeah, and I, I think that's better. <laughs> um, <laughs> fair enough. I mean, look, I think, I, think, I think there's a fair point about the sustainability, right? There's no question. I, I mean, but I do mean, I also think that, we'll, that we will innovate around that. And maybe there'll be another coin. Yeah. And we should be, you know, like, and we should all be fine with that. Like, you know, and so I don't, I don't hold a view that the problem is answered one way forever. You talked about uh, PayPal a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Our question to you is, what differences do you see in the region that you're operating in that perhaps you know, limits the capital, the kind of capital that PayPal got, they got to burn to expand, right? I think a lot of the other emerging countries don't get that kind of capital. Is there a challenge with that? Yeah, no, access to capital, if you ask me like what's been the biggest, you know, um, hold back even to growth is access to capital, right? And I'm glad to see there's more people now looking at Africa. Right. But when I think of what we've achieved um, in Nigeria, um, we've built a platform that is trusted, well-recognized brand. 42% of Nigerians recognize the brand. And in a market where there's a lot of marketing noise <laughs> um, and 18.6 million users, transactions are growing at a fast pace. You know, to give you a sense, we processed 2 trillion Naira worth of transactions in our first eight years. Wow. And that was from August of 2012 to March of 2020. The next 15 months, we process one trillion. Whoa. That's the acceleration we've seen coming out of uh, this period. And the next one trillion is in nine months. So we've achieved all of this on only $35 million. And when I tell people, they're like, what? Are you serious? Like, for how long have you been? I'm like, yes. But we know that with additional capital, you can scale even more. And we've built the platform and the ecosystem to be able to, to build on top of that, right? So access to capital is key. And that's one of the things that we think um, people are missing out and not looking at Africa, right? Because I think this is the next place in terms of where capital flows should come. We now have a few unicorns, which is great. We now have a few exits. Stripe acquired a company in Nigeria um, in 2020. So I think we will see more of this happening. Um, they're good businesses, um, not just Paga, but other businesses built ready um, for global scale, built with the quality of global scale, right? I think, I think you could serve as a role model for a lot of people who are trying mm. to get into entrepreneurship, right? Just from mm. your journey. Mm. Um, can you talk to us about your personal journey in entrepreneurship, how you got here? And is this where you expected it to be at this stage in your life? Mm. How, how did that come about? You know, I was raised by a single mom. Um, and to God bless her, she, you know, she raised five kids, wow. five boys. Wow. <laughs> and I was the last <laughs> of them. Um, and, you know, I saw her when she left the, her government job. I saw her start one business after the other. And none of them really reached their, what I thought, even then I thought could be their potential. But it, it helped me with the idea that, you know, there's something about, starting something and doing it and creating jobs for people and solving a problem, right? But I also thought to myself at the time, I was like, okay, you know, I, I guess later in life, I thought, I, oh, wow, she didn't, maybe she didn't have a business degree. That's why she did. <laughs> That's why I went to business school. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to go to business school. There's something about knowing something about business, right? Um, 
but I think that really sparked my interest in entrepreneurship. Um, you know, and she always encouraged me to reach for whatever my goals are. She never tried to hold me back on it. So for me, after business school, I went to work for Cisco Systems in acquisitions and venture. So helping Cisco invest in companies. And that even further sparked my interest, right? Because in any one year, I met with over 100 companies. And I was like, wow, you're doing that? That's really cool. You know, like, I just like seeing, and it really made me realize that in the US, actually small, small businesses are the engine of growth. They hire 20 to 50 people innovating on amazing ideas that are in so many different things that we use today. So that really sparked me to, to think about going into entrepreneurship. What inspired you to go from venture capital to being a founder yourself? I mean, it's a yeah. big decision to make. Yes, so I had two decision points. So one decision was, um, when, I ven when I thought I was gonna leave Cisco, I said, okay, my option, I actually wanted to go to venture capital, I thought, um, at the time, or do I start a business? But as I thought about it, on the boards I had been on for Cisco, representing Cisco, the people I thought added the most value in board meetings were people who had been operators. And so I thought to myself, I said, wow, okay, I think I need to go start something first and be an operator, right, uh, before I come back to venture capital. So I made that decision first. So I then said I was gonna start a business and then I started looking at ideas and actually I was gonna stay in the US um, and start a business that I think would have looked like Spotify actually, interestingly, <laughs> yeah. Um, because I was really enamored by the fact that I had all this music saved on a hard drive and I had this 40 minute drive from San Francisco to Santa Clara every day and I couldn't play my music. I was like, how could I do that? But then um, I got talking to a lot of my friends and they were, who were already back in Africa and they encouraged me to come back. Um, and one of them, Fred Swanica um, of the African Leadership Group said something very interesting to me that clicked. He said, you know, Nigeria, this is in 2007 by the way, he said Nigeria felt to him like where India and China were 15 years ago. So imagine the people who went back to India, China 15 years ago. They have built not just Indian conglomerates, they built global conglomerates. And that's the opportunity that you have in Nigeria. You should go do it. And I was like, wow, okay, cool. <laughs> Let me think about this. <laughs> yeah. how, do you, how important do you think our diasporas and entrepreneurship? Very important, very important because um, you know, the way, you know, you talked about access to capital as an example. The way capital moves is people you know and bridges, right, and understand. So folks in the diaspora, and we've seen this very well with India, I use as the example, because U.S. investors investing in India didn't just happen overnight, right? It was the diaspora in the U.S. that had worked with Americans that had made, you know, shown that, oh wow, there's actually a lot of capability coming out of smart people coming out of India, right? And then taking them back to go see stuff, and then that sort of starts happening. So I think it's really important, I say to anyone in the diaspora of any country, to be a good representation of your country, wherever you are, um, and to also build the bridges back, to be the initial investors and stuff. And I think that's how the diaspora can also really, really help. So we had one last question for you, mm. right? Appears that your mom was an inspiration for you. Mm. It shaped the way you view the world right now and mm. what you went about doing. Given the platform that you have right now and the amazing work that you're doing, I think millions of people can see the work that you're doing. Mm. What kind of future legacy do you want to leave behind for mm. the generations to come? Well, I think about my son, right? And what legacy, I can even tear it up here. What <laughs> legacy I, I want to leave behind for him um, I think fundamentally is that I want him to live in a world where he uh, can go after his dreams, whatever it is, and not feel held back by anything. Do you think we can get there one day? I think so. I think so. Um, when I look at him today, he's two years old now. I don't think, and I've seen him, and I've, we've traveled together, seen him, I don't think he recognizes skin color. Doesn't know, doesn't know anything about that. Um, he probably, you know, if you see my wife, she's very light skinned. He probably notices there's a bit of a difference. I'm darker, but, but it's nothing. Or just, like, <laughs> you know, our neighbor is Indian and they just had a little baby and he like sings baby Isha all the time. Like, you know, like he's like, he wants to see baby Isha. Oh, he knows it's just another baby. <laughs> he doesn't know, he doesn't know she's Indian. Like, you know, like what's that? Like, you know, um, and, and I want us to have that world where like, he can just go, you know, and his name is Japanese. His name is Nisho. 
you know, so, they, so when, when people hear his name, they're going to think like this is a Japanese kid I'm talking to, <laughs> like you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, and I want to, I don't, I want us to get there. I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there. A world where none of that stuff matters, like just you know, whether gender, sex, all this stuff, like all this stuff, is just like rubbish. Um, it's just all you know, we're just people. We're all human beings, and and we all have our own desires and goals, and and get a world where he can do that. So I want him to see that I built a company that recognizes that. Um, so I want him to to build on that legacy that you know that his dad did something that made life possible for billions of people. Well, thank you so much, Tayo. No. The pleasure having you on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much for having me. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thanks yeah. so much. We would love you to let others know about this podcast. So please rate us, leave us a comment, and share with someone who might enjoy it too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our next episode. 